I'm here to talk about a topic, application architecture. So who am I and why do you care? Um, my name is Christian Hammer. I'm the director of engineering for the global application platform at AppNexus. Uh, I'm a lifelong serial entrepreneur, and actually what I'm going to talk about is how we apply the CS principle of dry, which is something that we leverage quite heavily in the entrepreneurial world, to determine what we're going to build, how we're going to build it, and uh, then structure our applications and build up from the smallest atomic element. So my favorite emoji is the hammer, shocking with a name like Christian Hammer. Uh, anybody out there actually know the reference besides my name to the t-shirt I'm wearing? And one guy, what is it? Right. So the bad guy, I feel like the bad guy in every major movie or TV show happens to have the name Hammer, like in Iron Man 2, uh, Doc, or Dr. Hammer or Hannah Enterprises was a bad guy. In a sing-along blog, it was Hammer, so I just identify with it, feel like a bad guy. So uh, atomic application architecture is optimizing for three things. It's speed, and when I say speed, I do not mean of delivery, I mean of development. How fast can we get it into user hands? because ultimately, the faster we can get into user hands, or the, the faster we can determine whether or not what we built was a successful product. Uh, flexibility, the ability to change at speed so that when we know we're wrong, we can adapt. And then reliability, I throw that one as a tertiary one. It's not, uh, not a primary driver, but it's definitely part of the way that we think about it. So how did we get here and how do we start? As with any large startup, at one point, there was a very small team of engineers working on the products that we developed. Those, because of a small team being involved, uh, the simplest way to do that is to have a monolithic application that pulls it all together. You have a small team working on it. They can share the code. They can talk to each other directly. It's uh, fairly easy to support and develop and maintain, et cetera. I don't imagine anybody here thinks that that's a good pattern to follow long term as your team scales. Uh, so we started the process of breaking down that monolith. In doing so, we started to break out all the high-value screens, all the high-value processes, the places in our application that we know are fairly successful, that our customers are asking for, or that we're being uh, asked to iterate on rapidly. Those were pulled out of that monolithic application early because we had to iterate on it quickly. We had no choice. But what you end up with at the end of that process is what I call the junk drawer. And what do you do with the junk drawer? I mean, it's, it's full of things that you think might be valuable, but you really don't know. You, you don't really have a good way of evaluating it. There's a CD in my junk drawer. I have no idea what's on that. It might be like a, my documents from a laptop I threw away five years ago, but I've got that stupid CD in there still because who knows, it might be valuable. So when we made the assumption that we can just throw away the junk drawer, everything in its garbage, we don't need it. Don't carry it with us anymore. So these are screens, parts of the application, functionality, uh, use cases, whatever. Just assumptions we've made in the past that we know are wrong, or at least we assume are wrong. It allowed us to rethink all the other things we had done as well. So those breakout apps, if they're approaching a part of our application that we said, we know this is valuable, we're working on it. Did we make good assumptions when we broke that out as well? Or did we carry around some additional garbage, some additional junk that we just carried along because we don't know that it's bad. So how do we start to evaluate that question? How do we determine what we should be developing, what we should be carrying with us, and what we can throw away? And this process, and I don't want to go into detail on it because it's not really important that it, uh, you understand the little circles on it, but the, the point of it being is that an engineering team is often pulled by multiple teams in multiple directions. You'll have a product organization that'll develop a roadmap of features that they want. You'll have your uh, customers themselves directing you towards a different path, asking for functionality and features. Or you might have a user research team and a, uh, a user experience team that's uh, iterating on their own concepts of how to improve it. But really, that comes down to two different directions, honestly. It's uh, the product organization that's externally facing. They're looking at your customers, your, the market analysis, they're doing competitor analysis, and they're coming up with effectively a gap analysis. Here's what's missing. Uh, and then the internally facing, in our case, is user research, where they're taking a look at the customers that we have and uh, our own use of our own products and determining what that looks like. Both of them create the same statement, though. At the end of the day, what they've done, hopefully, is giving you a problem to solve, not a, a specific solution to it. At least that's the ideal. In doing this, 
started thinking about uh, atomic application architecture, like how do we break this down to its most fundamental particles and then start building back up for the flexibility and everything. Uh, so I'm going to give the big picture overview. Mike Bryan's going to come up and talk about sketch sessions, which are how we determine specifically what we're going to build to, ad to address that problem statement. We have a problem. How are we going to go about doing that? Uh, Isha is going to talk about Project Jello and how we specifically address this in one UI app that we built. And then uh, Andre will come up and, find, and close us out with a view on how we did the same thing for our deals application, which is a back-end app. So it's not specific to UI applications, hopefully. So back to that statement about the decomposition of the monolith. Uh, the problem that you often run into is understanding the smallest element of the problem. We went through an exercise years ago about breaking out portions of the application before we did the big breakup. We said that there's a repeatable pattern here. We're doing targeting modules for a bunch of different places in our application. It's shared functionality. It's something we need to do and reuse in multiple places. Uh, that's great. That's, that's, that's a good thing to do, right? It's reusable. I want to use it other places. But that wasn't as far as you can deconstruct that down. You can pull it apart further and realize that I'll use a, a better example that everybody will understand. Uh, in the e-commerce world, there's type ahead search that takes you to a grid wall, and that grid wall then has product descriptions on it and little pictures of the product and all that kind of thing. If you were to stop at the point of saying that that grid wall is your smallest component, you, you lost the ability to reuse each of those different pictures and those different descriptions and prices at different points in your application. So let's take it and break that down. Now I've got that as a smaller piece idea being very similar to microservices, but the, the problem that we often run into is going too deep, too. Uh, I like the, the natural role, like chemistry and physics uh, view of this stopping at the atom level and not diving into quarks and gluons and muons and those like much more uh, low-level particles, because it also stops at the place at which there's a natural world relationship to it. Like hydrogen we can interact with, but a gluon or a quark we have no reference or interaction with, so that no longer becomes functional in our world. So, <laughs> so instead of, okay. Sorry, internal joke. Uh, at our top level, rather than trying to start at a screen, we start at a problem statement. My user is trying to accomplish X, that's why they're using my tool. In the e-commerce example I mentioned before, they're trying to find a pair of shoes so they can go running. Uh, the whole process beginning at the moment they land on your site to the moment that there's products actually delivered at their home would be that entire workflow. Breaking it down a level further in an individual interface uh, is a step in that process. Again, not specific to a UI, just a step in the process. I use the word interface and not page or screen, because page and screen imply a static nature, which gets overloaded and becomes messy, and also because I don't want to imply just a, U a web app or a UI. Uh, we can break it down further. We can have compounds. We can have molecules. And at the basic, very bottom, we have the atomic elements. For us, that's actually represented by two different projects. We have an internal UI component library known as, uh, well, actually, the externally available version is Lucid UI. Uh, internally, we have ANX React, which builds on that a little bit. But, and then the uh, data services and the microservices that are on the other end of the spectrum. What we're left with, hopefully, is a series of reusable pieces that we can assemble into whatever we want. The reason I put Legos up here is I actually think they're a very good uh, example of how a toy company solved this problem. Legos have been around for a very long time, so it's nothing new. but the common problem in toy companies that they all have to deal with is the ever-changing, like, uh, finicky and uh, modified view that the kids in the world, like, view their world, things they care about. That was a long statement. But the, uh, let, let's say a Disney movie comes out and there's a fairy tale princess castle in it, and another movie comes out and there's a pirate ship. Well, which toy do they build? What's nice about something like Legos is they can build either the pirate ship or the castle because they've got the base components to build back into whatever they want. And if they really wanted to, they could build the hybrid of both and put it out in the marketplace too, which I can't actually believe this was a Lego set. So 
<laughs> to talk about how we decide whether we build the Lego castle or the pirate ship or the pirate castle, I'm going to bring up Mike Rand, who actually influenced my thinking on how we approach determining what to build and what we build uh, dramatically, and a lot of these ideas are stolen from him. So without further ado, Mike Rand. Awesome. Uh, thank you for the kind words, Christian. Um, as Christian mentioned, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm a senior designer at UpNexus, working on the header bidder product, which is formerly known as Jello. So I may use those terms interchangeably. Um, my favorite emoji is the nail care emoji because everyone loves to be fabulous. And I'm going to talk to you about something called sketch sessions. And these are basically just a collaborative design process where you get a whole bunch of people in a room to generate ideas. Um, and that's sort of how we come up with that vision for what we want to assemble our, assemble our atoms into. So I'll give you a little bit of context first about uh, why and how this has become useful for AppNexus. So AppNexus is what's called an enterprise software company. And that means that we make software for other companies, other large companies specifically. Um, and what you've probably noticed is that the software that you use for work is generally less fun and like less well-designed than software that you use just outside of work. Um, so you can think about something like you know, using Instagram versus using whatever you know, text editor you use. Um, quite often, something like Instagram is really beautiful. It's really delightful to use. It has lots of attention to detail. And quite often, a lot of like enterprise software is lacking this. And it sort of becomes clear that this is really a systematic issue. Almost every piece of consumer software feels more, more enjoyable than uh, enterprise or work software. And so the question is, why is that? And it's because of this distinction where with, an enter with consumer software, you both use it and you choose to use it, which, I mean, seems obvious. But with enterprise software, the person who's using it is not the same as the person who chooses. So this means that the person who's choosing to use a software is usually looking at something like a checklist of features and probably a price. And there's no really easy way to have a check for good design. There's no way to evaluate that until you've used it for a few days to actually know, does this fit into my workflow? So this means that an enterprise software company, it can be difficult to get good buy-in to the value and importance of good design. Um, and this is actually a shame, because if you've used terrible software in the past, you know that a bad user interface can really slow you down. Um, and it can slow you down, and it can get in your way, and it can make you a grumpy employee. Um, but good software can make you faster and make you more productive. So the problem that we sort of came up across at, at, on the UX team at UpNexus was, how do we sell the value of good design uh, and of shipping a well-designed product to the rest of the company? So we tried a few different things. The first thing we tried was actually running an internal conference. We sort of, what we discovered was that running a conference about design for people who don't care about design is not the most effective way, and it was not very well attended. Um, so after that, we decided to like, try working really closely with the agile practitioners, trying to set up like what is the right framework for working between designers and developers. And what we discovered is that you know, designers and developers should be working very closely together when you're working on the front end. Um, and there are just too many touch, sort of touch points between the two to be able to like, really carefully script that. Also, there are a bunch of other people at the company that need buy-in. And so we basically learned the same thing that Bernie Sanders learned, which is that grassroots is the most effective method for uh, institutional change. And here, sketch sessions have been incredibly useful. Uh, the teams that have been involved have gotten way more excited about shipping a well-designed product. Um, and that makes sense, because as you'll learn, they help design this product, and so they have a sense of ownership of it. It's their design that they want to ship. Um, yeah, so what is a sketch session, and how does it work? So it's pretty simple. Um, there are basically four steps to it, um, which is creating a document. So this document is basically a summary of what you've learned and what the requirements are for the product. Um, you think about who you want to invite in that sketch session, and you actually then run the sketch session, and I'll dive into all these in a little more depth, um, and then you sort of document and prioritize everything that you came up with in that. So the first step is creating a document, and this is basically about distilling everything you know down to something that you can communicate to people very quickly. Um, so usually it's sort of 
after you've talked to user research, product, and anybody else you need to, you know, what are the actual requirements of, of what you're designing? So this is an example, slightly modified from one that we've used in the past. Um, and what I'll do is dive into some of the different parts of it so you can really understand what's going on here. So first up, we've got a goal. Um, and this actually probably requires a little more thought than normal. Um, so you want to make sure that it really aligns to what the goal of the product is. So ours here, increase successful signups that actually serve an AppNexus ad. So AppNexus is a marketplace company. You know, we have buyers and sellers. And that means that we don't want to just sign up anybody. We want to sign up people who have inventory that's actually really useful for our advertisers. And so that's why we go beyond just increase successful signups to people who actually serve an ad, because that's a good sign that the inventory is good quality. Uh, below that, we have a hypothesis. So this is basically a little bit of direction for people to help them uh, drive towards that goal. You're going to have a lot of people in your sketch session who are probably not designers, and you want to give them you know, a hint of what they can do to have that goal, that impact. Um, and we've had a few different ones. So this example here is relatively specific. Fewer steps will make users more likely to sign up. Um, we've had more broad ones in the past, such as a more visual interface will make it more engaging for new users. And I've heard a friend at Pinterest can get very specific with theirs to something like, you know, more visual weight on the button will lead to more conversions. Below that, we have our required field. Uh, sometimes this is also just a list of tasks. In this case, account creation, it's uh, basically a form. So this is just a list of the form fields. I'm working on another project, which is uh, the app switcher. And so that's instead of something like form fields, it's, you know, user has to be able to switch between apps, within, uh, between workflows within an app, uh, sign in, sign out, that sort of stuff. And then finally, a note section, which is basically just the junk drawer. Um, it's basically any uh, context that you need to add on. So uh, the Jello or header bidding UI is the first time we've had like a good reason to care about mobile. Um, so you know we always have this reminder about designing mobile first. Um, we also have some. I've also got something in here, sort of like you can group things differently, so it doesn't always have to be username and password together. You know you can explore different ideas. Um, yeah. So the next step is to actually invite people. And the main reason I break this out into a separate step is to encourage a diversity of roles. Basically, all the different uh, jobs that people have have different, uh, different touch points. So for example, user researchers uh, understand the mental models of different users. Um, engineers understand the systems that they're working with. You know, Product and sales might understand um, what the customer needs are. So then you have to actually run the sketch session meeting. Um, and if you're familiar with the concept of the GV design sprints, uh, it's basically what's called a design alone together process. And so this is based off uh, some research that found that brainstorms are not actually that useful. Um, they don't come up with the most useful and innovative ideas uh, when you have a group of people to get look, sitting together looking at a whiteboard and sort of brainstorming ideas. Instead, uh, what we do is sit down and each come up with our ideas on our own and then share them. So the way this works is you welcome everybody to the sketch session. Um, and if people are new, I'll give them an overview about like, like what I'm about to do. And then, so I start off by talking through the document that I showed earlier, seeing if there are any questions, making sure everyone understands all of the goals and the requirements. Um, I have had some cases in the past where you, uh, one of the engineers has mentioned, oh, you know, I see, so for a domain verification, we were going to make people upload a file to prove that they had ownership of a domain. Uh, one of the engineers mentioned that users could also just edit their who is information. And so we changed the document to make, so that to include giving people the option for which one they wanted. Once we've gone through that and there are no questions, everyone understands, uh, I like to make sure everyone has a pen and paper so they can sketch. And then you set a timer for five minutes. When that timer's up, we sort of go through and share what ideas uh, we've come up with. So this is an, an example of uh, one of the sketches. So usually when people are sharing, they talk about two things. First of all, what it is you're looking at. As you can see, five minutes isn't a lot of time. So it's basically a lot of boxes and arrows. 
Um, and then they'll also explain why. So basically, they'll be like, oh, this guy over here, this, this, this is a row to explain what a placement is. You know, I, I put them like that so that you could scan through a whole bunch of them really quickly. Once that's done, you're going to do that again, so a second round. And do you want to sort of encourage stealing here? Um, what we found in the second round is that people tend to take ideas from the first round that they like. And this is great because it becomes sort of an implicit voting of you know, what ideas you should actually take through into the final product. Um, so yeah, set another timer for five minutes again. People go through and, and sort of come up with whatever sketches they have. And then you have an explicit discussion of what people actually liked. Um, so a good example of this, uh, when we were doing the application switcher that I mentioned earlier, in the first round, someone there are a lot of different ideas, and one of them, someone was like, oh, so here I've got, I really like the way Slack does their uh, team switching, so I sort of put something similar like that over here. And then the second round, we saw that idea show up like three or four times. It became clear that people actually liked it. Uh, when we got to the explicit discussion part, then people mentioned, I like the way that Slack does it. Um, so I think, yeah, implicit and explicit voting is kind of nice. Once it's done, you want to document it. So another nice thing about the design sprint is that they, they really focus on making sure that you save everything that people create, because people get attached to their ideas. And in the future, you may need to come back to these to come up with variations on what you're actually working on. So usually what I do is I, I take all those sketches, and I document the discussion, and throw them in the document uh, where I original that I showed you before. So just below uh, the requirements and the notes, put in the sketches and put in the discussion so that people can come back to that, see the full context of like why those design decisions were made. So these sketch sessions have been super successful at AppNexus uh, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, they really help uh, surface institutional knowledge. In that discussion period, all the different roles get to sort of talk about what they've seen from their perspective. So, the salesperson may say, oh, yeah, that really visual design would make it really easy to sell our software since you know, it would be a great screenshot. And the user researchers might say, oh, this, this one's really great because it matches our user's mental models. Um, engineers can point out what might be easier or harder to develop. Um, so that's one of the benefits. It also means that you can understand, everyone can understand why certain design decisions were made. Um, they don't need to ask or see documentation, which saves a bunch of time. And then everyone gets excited about shipping that really great end result because it's their end result. They are the ones who sort of came up with it, uh, which is really nice. And then finally, a side benefit as a UX designer at AppNexus is that running these helps people understand that what we do is not just visual design. So if you're interested in sketch sessions, you can read more about them on Medium. Um, it should be the top article there. And then we are currently looking for designers. So if you know anybody, please send them through to uh, appnexus.com slash careers. Uh, and yeah, I hope you give sketch sessions a shot. They've been a really great um, shortcut to brainstorming for us. Next up is Isha, who is a phenomenal sketcher. And she's going to talk to you about taking uh, that sketch vision that we come up with and then building it with atomic elements. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Isha Petty Reddy. I am an engineering team lead based in Portland, Oregon. My favorite emoji right there, success kid. It's the most satisfying one to send by far. So if you're wondering whether or not you need to have um, solid drawing skills to be able to participate in sketch sessions, fear not. Uh, this is a sketch of mine for a dashboard concept that we worked on a few weeks ago. The really important thing is for your ideas to come through, not for the picture to look pretty. So here you can see I have a, a custom date range picker, two stat tiles that tell you how you're doing based on your revenue and impressions and a chart that breaks that data down by the date range. If you're curious from an engineering perspective, sketch sessions have been really useful for us, and I strongly encourage you to take the time to adopt it and see if it works for your team. Not only does it allow you to take a step back from the code and get creative, it also uh, allows you to have an open discussion about feasibility of design proposals off the bat, so there are no surprises down the road. And that's really helpful. And as a bonus, it helps bridge the gap between UX and engineering. 
For our team, the sessions have been, like I mentioned, really useful, and they also result in a more collaborative approach to design. Um, with that being said, as Mike mentioned earlier, it's always fun to see your ideas come to fruition in the final product. I'll be focusing on two, the two themes in my talk today. One is breaking down the monolith, and two is leveraging the self-driving car model and building on new UI applications. Um, so I'll speak a little bit about the AppNexus Exchange platform, which is also referred to as Jello, which Christian mentioned earlier, and so did Mike, um, and how it adheres to the atomic application model. We're, what we're doing is, rather than having one monolithic application, we're moving towards providing a suite of applications, um, which can then be used to package a customizable solution for any given user. Because if you think of it this way, not everybody needs a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> Some need something that's really easy to use, that they can go on about their day with, that, with little to no configuration, like a Vespa, which this is the base case, right? So then you take this and you add a little bit of complexity, but you still want to have it um, be easy to use, still little to no configurability, Tesla. <laughs> and then you still have your larger clients who want a highly customizable solution. So you need to be able to build a Batmobile. <laughs> um, the car analogy is great because it really applies to both themes in my talk. Um, for one, by breaking out applications into their own independent standalone applications, you're able to package them back up to provide a customized solution to meet any client's needs. So you can build a Tesla version or you can build the Batmobile for a client that's a little bit more sophisticated. And then <laughs> by taking away large, complex features from applications, and keeping workflows simple and easy to use, you're able to onboard smaller clients who don't have the resources to manage a really complex architecture. So this is what that looks like. So you have the Odyssey, which is the monolith, that's comprised of uh, many applications with little to no separation. And then you take that, you break each application out into its own independent application. And the goal here is really it's not to reach achieve parity, but really to take a step back and think about simplifying your workflow and reducing the complexity in each application. So you have a functional base to start with, and then you can build on top as needed for clients. Like I mentioned, they're a little bit more sophisticated and need the customized solution. So this idea really came about when we started to think about scaling our application to smaller users or smaller publishers that don't have the resources to manage a really complex um, environment. So they need something that they can come in, they can do a little configuration and still um, get on about their day without having to worry too much about spending hours trying to configure their ad quality settings uh, in just the right way to get what they need. So let's take client A, for example, who's a smaller client that I was just talking about, who wants, who trusts us to make the right decisions for them. And so we can do, do that for them in application A, B, C, the first three applications we have out of the six, package that up, and that's their product. And then we have the more sophisticated user who wants the Batmobile. Um, they're okay with having the first three applications be the base applications, and then they want the fifth to be, um, they want to have a little bit more freedom in what they set on top. So we can add a layer of complexity there for them and package that back up and provide that solution for them. So to give you a little bit of context, here's an, the ad quality workflow from our enterprise application. As you can see, there's a lot, a lot going on here. Um, to give you a better idea, this is just a subset of things that you can adjust, and all those numbers refer to an object. And this is what we ended up with in the self-driving car model. So as you can see, we've ripped a lot of things out. That doesn't mean that those settings can't be set. What we've done is figured out which settings make the most money for our clients, and 
set it up for them in a way that they don't have to worry about that, because that's something we assume that clients are going to want. And then what we've exposed here is sensitive attributes that we can't really infer on a general basis. Like if, if a client wants pharmaceutical ads on their page and they're okay with that, they can allow that to go through. So to jump into a little bit more of the implementation details of the new interfaces we're building out, um, we'll take a step back. And here are all the compounds that are composed, or that are used to compose our new interfaces, where each compound is a Lucid component. And if you haven't heard of Lucid, it's our open source UI component library built by the UI platform team in-house. Um, and I have their GitHub link in there, so you can check it out later after the talk. So we use each of those component or compounds to build out our interface, which you've already seen. And as Mike mentioned earlier, this is the first project we're really driving mobile first with. So this is the mobile version of the desktop version I showed you earlier. And then here's the workflow that fits the smaller client, client A's needs, where there's three applications, first one being the logo, that's the dashboard, and then placements manager and ad quality. Just to give you an idea of how this looks in terms of lines of code, um, here it is. <laughs> so it's, like I mentioned, it's not a direct comparison because we pulled a lot of complexity out of the original screen, so a lot of the levers that we originally made available to clients aren't there anymore um, because they've been set on the back end. But this kind of gives you an idea of where we're headed in terms of reducing complexity in the application and um, in the code base. Feels pretty good. <laughs> easier to manage, um, easier to build on top of. So now that I've given you a little view into where we're headed uh, in terms of building out framework, to provide a suite of lightweight applications which we can package back up for a particular user, I'll hand it off to Andre, aka Dre, <laughs> to talk about how his team achieved mobility within a complex data pipeline. Here we go. Hi, everybody. I'm Andre. I'm an engineering manager. Uh, uh, within the Global Application Platforms Group, uh, based out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, I work on the sell side uh, of, our, of our product suite. And my favorite emoji is the burrito, because I think they're like the perfect food. I love burritos. <laughs> um, so uh, while Isha and Mike talked about building uh, and implementing UIs, my talk's going to focus more on uh, building, back out, uh, building out back-end services. Um, though ultimately, we'll end up back at the UI at the end of the talk. Um, so before I get into the nitty-gritty, I thought what I'd do is just share like a little bit more about what AppNexus does and the problem domain uh, for which we were working in, just to have a little more context before uh, I get into talking about the technical details. So uh, what does AppNexus do? If you're in this building, maybe you know, but if not, that's okay. Uh, so we provide the tools and services that allow for the programmatic buying of digital ads. Uh, so we bring together buyers and sellers uh, on our exchange. So in our domain, uh, a seller is a publisher, someone who has content, uh, fundamentally a website, uh, and a buyer is an advertiser. So uh, there's a couple different ways in which uh, ads are bought and sold within our platform. Uh, one is something called an auction. So a request for an ad comes in, uh, and advertisers have the opportunity to bid for the right to show their ad uh, on that publisher's site. Uh, so Sellers like this, publishers like this, because it gets them the most revenue uh, by you know, having an auction and having advertisers bid against each other. Uh, and advertisers like it because they know they're paying fair market value uh, to have their ad displayed. So an open auction, sometimes called uh, real-time bidding, that happens in a few milliseconds. Uh, another flavor of that is something called a deal. So a deal represents a pre-negotiated, pre-established relationship between a buyer and seller. Um, uh, they can log into our system to configure uh, a deal. Uh, so it's a one-to-one -one relationship between a buyer and seller. Uh, and for the advertiser, um, what they like about, uh, about a deal uh, is that it gives them pre-negotiated, maybe preferential pricing, um, preferential access to uh, publisher's, uh, publisher's inventory for ads. Uh, and sellers like it because they can package up their inventory and they know they can get uh, that inventory bought by the quality advertisers that they, uh, they want to work with. So, uh, we have billions of these impressions. We have billions of these requests for ads that come into our system every day, tens of billions. And one of the questions that a buyer and seller might be asking is, well, how well is my deal doing? 
Okay, I've set this thing up, but what's the performance of it? Uh, is it doing well? And if you can't measure something, you can't change it. So with our billions and billions of transactions coming into our system every day, we needed to find a way to do a better job of reporting uh, metrics about deals uh, to back to our users. So that's what our talk will focus on, deal metrics. Uh, before we go to uh, how we re-architect it, we need to go back a year to before we rebuilt uh, our deal metrics features. So they had a few problems. In fact, it wasn't very good at all. Uh, one of the most egregious problems with our deal metrics reporting uh, was the recency of the data. It was not very recent. The data was anywhere from an hour to a day old, meaning that by the time you saw something of interest in the data, it might be too late to take advantage of it. So stale data was one problem. Another challenge we had was our UI was just slow. It wasn't that great to work with. Uh, large reason for that was we were querying for that data sort of at page load time from a bunch of different sources. So you go to load the page, we go out to a reporting API where there's a ton of data, we go to another database where it's got some other metadata, and we try to stitch that data set together and bring it back to the UI um, on the fly at page request times. So that wasn't really great. Uh, so the data was mashed together on their front end. So if you had to do things like paginate, sort, things of that nature, uh, it was a less than amazing experience. <laughs> So we knew we had some problems we had, to, we had to solve. We had to figure out how we could get large volumes of data back to the user uh, and aggregate it quickly. Uh, this data is coming from a bunch of different data sources. Sometimes it's arriving at different times. We have different pieces of information coming into the system at different times. We figured out how to get all that data put together and back to the user uh, uh, in, a, in a quick fashion. So what did we do? Well, we do what all engineers like to do. We build a proof of concept. Yes, I love proof of concepts, right? You get to play with new tools, new libraries, another responsibility of writing any tests, and the thrill that maybe your proof of concept without any tests will end up in production someday. Love that. Love proofs of concepts. So we labeled, or we called our proof of concept PCDC, uh, short for Partner Center Data Cache. Uh, the partner center nomenclature coming from the fact that uh, our deal metrics features reside within the partner center uh, feature of our application. Uh, and the problem we were trying to solve with this proof of concept was how do we query from a bunch of different data sources on a recurring scheduled basis to find a complete picture of the entities that we want to return to the user. So we've got some data here, we've got some data here, it's coming at different times. How do we solve that problem? So this proof of concept was to help us flush that out. Uh, what we did is built a Scala uh, Play and Akka app that, again, on a recurring scheduled basis, would talk to the data sources that it was configured, know how to look for a particular entity, get the properties it needs, put together one document, and then either create or replace the document in Elasticsearch. Uh, so we had this built out to configure or to talk to a bunch of different data sources, APIs, uh, MySQL, Postgres. Uh, pretty much any data source you can think of, uh, and it worked really well. And we built a Node API in front of it to extract away some of the complexities of uh, querying into Elasticsearch. Okay, cool. Proof of concept successful. We know we can talk to a bunch of different data sources, figure out how to pull together one uh, complete entity, and then push it off into, uh, into Elasticsearch. So next problem is the sheer volume of data that we have coming into our system. Uh, so we had to figure out how do we quickly process, how do we quickly ingest, process, and uh, aggregate these billions of transactions coming into our system. So for that, we built a data pipeline, a deals data pipeline. Uh, so if you're not familiar with the concept of a data pipeline, that's okay. I think the most important thing to take away is that it's continuous. Uh, so as compared to you know nightly ETL jobs, nightly batch jobs, MapReduce jobs, things of that nature, what we're able to do is read data off of our transaction log as it comes in, then put it through a sequence of steps, aggregating the metrics along the way, ultimately persisting it out to a uh, MySQL database. So we used uh, tools called Apache, Kafka, and Sansa uh, to build out this data pipeline. There's a wealth of information about these online, so I won't go into too much detail uh, about these two tools. However, uh, Apache Kafka is a distributed streaming data pipeline, so you can think of it excuse me, as PubSub on steroids. And Apache SAMS is, is a distributed stream processing, stream processing framework. So Kafka is like the PubSub uh, system. SAMSA lets you uh, uh, do the calculations and run jobs on that data as it's moving through the pipeline. Uh, so the way this worked is we would read data coming in off of something called Impression Bus. So Impression Bus is our publicly facing service that receives those billions of requests for, uh, for ads each day. We have a bunch of different logs uh, within Impression Bus. So we would take the log, take the transactions coming in off of Impression Bus, we'd look at the timestamp on those transactions, and then put those transactions into one minute bucket increments. Uh, so then we'd take those one minute bucket increments as time moves forward, hand them off to a 10 minute uh, uh, aggregation job. I should back up a little bit. So 
in those one minute buckets, we had uh, the records keyed off of an ID along with the metrics about that deal as well. So those are being built up in the pipeline. We hand them off to a 10 minute job that does further aggregations. At 10 minutes, we'd write the data off to MySQL to persist it and then take the 10 minute aggregations, move them on to the one hour job and then the one hour job off to the 24 hour job. So we're able to take advantage of the fact that we're calculating these on the fly uh, as we go along and building up uh, greater and greater aggregations uh, as we went along. So I should mention uh, another benefit of a data pipeline is it really reduced the data retention requirements uh, on our system as well. So we didn't have to read this data in off impression bus, save it somewhere else, and then read it back out uh, for you know, processing. We're able to take these transactions off that log as they come in and then move them through the data pipeline. So we were able to process uh, around 580,000 messages per second. So it's Pretty good amount of data, uh, or about 720 megabytes per second. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, so at the end of the pipeline, uh, our object looked like this. Now you don't have to, you don't have to understand everything that's uh, in here, but what we can see is we have our ID for ideal. Uh, we have a window size, which is the uh, time series increment in seconds, so either 60 seconds, 600 seconds, 3600 seconds, uh, etc. Uh, we have a window index, so when we're querying this data back out of MySQL, we have that index and it just lets us stitch it back together in the right order uh, in the right time, uh, as well as a bunch of other metrics about, about uh, the deal. So we've got bids, uh, things of that nature, revenue, um, and so forth. So we'll see these metrics a little later on when we get back to the interface. All right, so we know how to query for data from a couple different data sources uh, when it's coming in at different times on a recurring basis. We know how to aggregate a lot of data. So let's step back and take a perspective of this, uh, focusing on Christian's uh, uh, concepts of atomic design theory. So the atoms in our case were the impression bus data, so those uh, low-level transactions uh, coming into the system, uh, as well as metadata about the deals that were residing off uh, in another database. So I just talked about how we aggregated those impressions and turned them into uh, a molecule of, of aggregation. Uh, so the next level up is the molecule. So what we did was took PCDC, we got the band back together, we took BCDC, threw away that code, thankfully it didn't actually make it into production in its original form, uh, and we rebuilt that uh, as a deals application. So again, we're using Scala, Play, and Akka uh, for this app. And so the Scala and Play is the deals app in orange up here. And what this app is doing is talking to the deals metadata database, that's a MySQL database, and it's on a recurring basis, pulling that, looking for uh, new information about deals in that database, and then pulling it over and putting it into the same database where Kafka and Sam's are aggregating those metrics uh, and persisting that off to that MySQL database. So what the deals app is doing is just putting together one cache of data in MySQL that represents everything we need to be able to report on metrics in the UI. Uh, so we're normalizing data. And we're giving ourselves a single source of truth, which makes presenting this data back to the UI a lot easier. So let's zoom out just a little bit further. This is what the compound looks like. Uh, so this is sort of the complete picture of the flow of data uh, through our system. So we have Impus. I talked about that just a minute ago. The records uh, come through Impus, go through a couple more uh, systems, one called Packrat and Packrat Log Forwarder. Uh, and then they go into Kafka and SAMHSA, so that's our data pipeline, and they iterate it in there for a little while and move through, as I talked about, building out those higher levels of aggregations go into the MySQL database where uh, those metrics are stored, and then we have the deals app querying another database to pull that information together. Uh, I do have another line going out to a key value store, which is Aerospike. I'll talk about why we do that in just a minute. Uh, and then ultimately, the deals app uh, serves as an API for the UI as well. Cool, all right, back at the interface. Uh, so after we finished re-architecting uh, and rebuilding this data pipeline, what we're able to do is provide much more recent metrics in our UI about deals. So we're able to provide metrics up to the last 10 minutes, so a user can go in and choose that 10 minute interval and see uh, uh, you know, within a very temporally relevant time period uh, the performance of their metrics using the components that uh, Isha talked about. Uh, so a little further, we have a grid of metrics. So these are the same metrics that you saw in that object uh, a few minutes ago uh, presented in the UI. So we're able to provide uh, really rich uh, and compelling information that's actionable. It's recent, it's actionable, which is important. Uh, and it loads very quickly as well because we have it in one uh, database all ready to go and bring back to the UI. Uh, and then if you drill into one 
uh, specific deal, we were able to give uh, a really nice looking chart about the performance of the deal for the past 24 hours, and that's where we're pulling that information uh, out of Arab Spike. We just needed to be, have a slightly faster data store uh, to quickly retrieve that time series information. So that's our story. Um, as you embark on your next project, consider uh, approaching it from the perspective of atomic design. Think in terms of atoms and molecules and compounds. Uh, Leverage sketch sessions, uh, as you heard Mike talked about, to uh, generate enthusiasm and excitement and get buy-in from your key stakeholders within your organization. Uh, look at your sketches and decompose them into the lowest level elements. Find your atoms in your UI sketches. Those are the pieces you can't break down any further without them uh, losing their value. And start to recompose those UI elements into UI molecules. Uh, those molecules have a single purpose. They're reusable. You can put them into your interface anywhere. Uh, and then take those molecules and build them up into compounds, UI compounds. Uh, think in terms of workflows and not pages. So this approach doesn't necessarily just work for UIs. You can use it for your backend services as well, like I talked about. If you've got a lot of data and you need to report on it, that's not an uncommon paradigm, right? Think about your transactional data as your atoms. Uh, and then use a data pipeline like I talked about to build out those aggregations and those metrics uh, very quickly. Uh, your molecule is uh, you know, your forward cache. So if you take those metrics, put them in a database or, or uh, a cache, make them available and simply accessible to your UI, uh, and then build APIs on top of that forward cache to very quickly get that information back to the front end in a way that doesn't require a lot of data manipulation uh, from your front, front end code. Uh, so that does it for our talk for today. So I think at this point, I'll invite uh, Christian, Isha, uh, and Mike back up to stage for some Q&A. Thank you. I had a question about um, what you were talking about at the last piece of the talk there. What was the interaction between your UI atoms and your uh, data or model atoms, if you like? And how, how, are those, how are those composed? Because the UI atoms in, them, in themselves are nothing. Uh, sure. and the, the, without the interaction, the, the, the back-end atoms are nothing too. How, how do you, you... Right. So isolating each of those individual pieces to their um, least useful form, like it's still useful, but it's marginally useful, so we can build on complexity as we go up. Uh, the, the direct integration between like the data services or the API, the forward cache, is compound, and the interface isn't happening at the atomic level, it's happening at the interface level, or in some cases actually at the workflow. Uh, it's happening across many interfaces directly via the Ford cache. So someone mentioned earlier, I don't recall if it was impressions or ad requests, but it was in volume somewhere upwards of like 10 billion. Um, so how do you guys, in terms of the data pipeline or the deal pipeline, how do you guys handle that sort of volume? <laughs> Go ahead. I can try. So full disclosure, I've been with that Nexus for about three months, so I wasn't uh, around for a lot of what uh, uh, I talked about being built, um, but Apache, Kafka, and Samza, uh, they're distributed by nature, so we scale horizontally, fundamentally. Uh, the tools really provide a lot of uh, uh, what we need to make that happen. Okay, so it's like easy to deal with the scale. It is, yeah, the tools really provide it. So they have a concept of, of partitions, and you can horizontally scale those partitions. The partitions map to topics, uh, so you can read all about it in the documentation, but it's fundamentally the tools give us uh, what we need there. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, one more. I'm just curious. I know a lot of people get self-conscious about art and sketching anything. Mm -hmm. How did you encourage non-artists to, to participate? And, and yeah, that seems makes them really vulnerable. <laughs> uh, I think once you show people one or two of your sketches, so people who are new, I generally just show them like, this is some of the stuff we've done before. It's just squares and arrows. People generally are pretty okay with that. Like even, even the, the worst artist can draw something that resembles a square and that's all you really need. It's about communicating an idea, not necessarily making something beautiful. 
And I can jump in on that too. So I am the world's worst artist. Uh, I can barely draw a stick figure. And so uh, Mike invited me to a sketch session uh, sor- shortly after I started, and I felt the same trepidation. I was nervous. You know, you've got five minutes and you have this problem that's presented to you, and it's like, ah, how am I going to draw this? Uh, so we were just talking about this actually before I came up here. And so one strategy is to have someone put out something really silly. Right? Uh, so I have another artist that's in the group put out something kind of really ridiculous, and it sort of gives permission and space for everyone else to know that, like, hey, we're just having fun, we're just trying to get ideas out. You don't have to be a perfect artist. Uh, and the fact that it's time constrained to five minutes really forces you to keep it really simple anyways. You're not creating high-fidelity sketches. You're f- really just drawing boxes with arrows pointing at them. Uh, so, but yeah, it's a great question. I think your first time in there, you will feel a little bit of stress, but after you do it a couple of times, you'll find out it's actually really fun and you get a lot of value out of it as well. It, it, there's a couple other things I want to point out about sketch sessions that influenced a lot of this that uh, I didn't really talk about. Uh, one of them is that it short circuits the requirements gathering process because really we're just, we have identified a problem and we're going to get everybody that has an impact on this in a room together and we're going to sketch out ideas and work it through. Uh, So it short circuits that process, which is great. The second, which I think is kind of a great thing also, is it makes people more pliant when they're thinking about a problem, like they're going to be less resistant to your solution to the problem, and not just because they're involved in it, but the creative process itself actually makes people less likely to say negative things about it, to be more um, creative with their own thought process around it, which is fantastic, get buy-in much easier. Hold on. <laughs> I got that. No, wait, I got that. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm just curious, when a designer or a UX engineer and an actual like developer have disagreements, how do you handle like solving that problem, or like, you know, how do you take the next step in determining who's right, or like what approach to go with? Yeah. Um, I guess we can talk about that. (laughs) So I think like from my side, it's usually, there are, there's usually an infinite number of solutions to any problem. And so, you know, depending on what the actual challenge is, it's sort of like, well, these are some different ideas talking through, um, you know, what part of the solutions are important for the user. I mean, what, what's your perspective? Yeah, I think. We haven't really run into that issue a lot, especially since we started doing the sketch sessions, because there are more people involved and there are a lot of ideas that come out of it. Um, so there isn't, you know, it's not like you're stuck with one idea and you really want to drive that home. It's you're you're more open to other ideas and kind of, I don't know. We always come to a conclusion and agree upon a solution that kind of incorporates all of them. And yeah. so it's kind of it's helped bridge that gap a little bit. Like we haven't really run into any issues. Yeah, and I feel like you guys also can like veto ideas pretty quickly, being like, that's a great idea if we have five years to develop it. Right. <laughs> so that's kind of what I was referring to in my talk, too. Like, kind of, you, off the bat, you can talk about what's feasible to build in a short amount of time, you know, based on, we're doing rapid development, so we only have a couple of weeks to a month um, to build something out. So that also helps narrow down the scope as to what you want to build. And I think the other benefit to the sketch session, so you have the engineers and the UI UX folks in the same room together, and so it's collaborative and it's iterative. So hopefully, you know, as you go through the sessions, there's like a natural convergence to one solution, because you go through it a bunch of times. And so I think your question's right on point, because it really is driven to solve like, that problem, because you have these people in the room you know, collaborating on the designs together. Mm-hmm.